Welcome to the latest edition of the Shukri Rights Podcast with your host, Shukri Rights. I cannot believe I'm doing this, but for those of you that have been following the journey for almost a year now, I have never, until now, had two guests on the same podcast at the same exact time until now, let alone from the same radio station. So joining me today are, are, are two really good friends of mine, one, one in which is just blunt as hell, and I'm excited to have him back, actually both of you back, Sean Silver and Christian Arcan, both of 98.5 The Sports Up. What's going on, Captains? What's going on? <laughs> What's up, Shu? Good to be back, man. Uh, glad to see all the success you're having. I'm glad you still have time for people like us now that you got Stop Craig it. Carton and all those oh, other God. big guests coming on now. Still oh, have time to God. squeeze those other guys, so thank you for that. I can't <laughs> believe you just did that. I just, I cannot believe this guy, this guy. Sean, what's going on? <laughs> can I ask a, can I ask a question here? Sure. Uh, which one of us is blunt as hell? Yeah, right. I mean, you, I mean, Sean, you have your own way of, of, of delivery. Christian, on the other hand, is like, no. You're just raw. And I think it's the, it stems, it's the stems from like our first conversation, which was last summer. And that was like the that was literally the beginning of our friendship where it was like he was just raw off the bat. And I'm like, I, I dig this guy. Yeah, that's my style. Like, yeah, like, no, like we're, we're not going to censor ourselves. Like, absolutely not. So what that's, we're going to do, that's that's literally Christian style. <laughs> that's how I can't for you. He is Eddie Murphy raw. He is just. Yeah, that's 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 the uh, that's the guy I've gotten to know. So it's it's Thanks. good to get to chop it up with Thanks the two of you. That, <laughs> that sounded, it sounded nice. I don't know if it was, but it sounded good. <laughs> what, I mean, I would hope that I would hope it's nice. I mean, I, th- I thought it was nice. I mean, it definitely was. Of, Although, have you sure. noticed those Eddie Murphy Ross sketches don't really hold up these days too well anymore? No, 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 no. What it's really funny. does, though? What really yeah. does? That's a great question. That's a great question, because. I had Andy Gresh on, on, on last week's um, podcast, and we both made the point where in 2021, it's like certain jokes you can't make because it would be deemed either offensive or, oh my God, I can't believe he's actually um, trying to like make this, t- this sort of a joke. And it's like, huh? I don't see what the problem is. Like you can't, you can't sing baby. It's cold outside without someone saying, <laughs> Oh my gosh, you're, you're a sexist. You're misogynistic. How dare you? Like, huh? I mean, even, even Dr. Seuss uh, from the grave is having, a Oh God. Oh, I you know, it's oh just, God. Uh, hey, every, everything changes and evolves and, and we got to yeah. kind of take everything in stride, I guess, learn from it. But uh, yeah, it sure does make for one kind of shitstorm on Twitter, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Christian, can I say something about Dr. Yes, Seuss? yes, you guess you can. Dr. Seuss didn't get canceled, okay? Dr. Seuss has not been canceled. Dr. Seuss wrote like 65 books and his own foundation that publishes them mm-hmm. decided we're not going to uh, keep selling like five of them or six yeah. of them or something yeah. like that. What mm-hmm. that I've like never heard of? Five. And they it's because there's like racist pictures in them. Like that's not a big, I don't know, man, like. I understand that at some point people go too far about what's offensive and what isn't, but I also think like people go way too far on the other side about being canceled. Like Dr. Seuss yeah. isn't canceled. The Muppets aren't canceled. Mr. Potato Head's not canceled. And who gives a fuck about any of that stuff? Anyway? <laughs> <laughs> we got a pandemic going around and there's people upset that you can't pin a penis on Dr. On Mr. Potato Head. <laughs> Who cares? <laughs> I got nothing. I, I, listen. <laughs> I got nothing. No, no. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm going to let the host take it from here. I got I'm, nothing. I'm, tr- I'm trying to get myself to keep it together, but it's like, this. but this is what I was talking about, ladies and gentlemen, when I said, this is the raw Christian I have gotten to know, and I'm still getting to know more. And it's like, I'm not mad. And you know something? I want to touch on the Dr. Seuss um, situation, if that is even a thing, a situation, because I haven't seen the images. I haven't even seen, like, what on earth, like, is everybody else talking about? So it's like, am I, y'all really throwing a storm on social media over this? We've got bigger things, bigger fish to fry, and we're worrying about Dr. Seuss, who's been around since, what, 1940-something? Like, are you kidding me? Like Dr. Seuss wasn't just some recent 
cartoon character that just came about out of nowhere and it's like oh hey great you're you're here so let's just see what what can we take from it but it's like are you kidding me like we we got we got bigger worries um than dr seuss not selling five of the 60 plus books to whatever amount that there is out there it's just it's just insane yeah i mean i get why people pick on stuff like that because you know, it gets everyone riled up and talking and, you know, arguing with each other and yelling and screaming. And I know a little bit about that business. I yell and scream at Jones every single day and we yell and scream at each other. <laughs> that's sort of what we've chosen to do. But it's pretty obvious. Like, I think it's pretty obvious when someone picks like a dumb topic like that, like Mr. Potato Head, and decides it's got to be this big, important thing that everyone has to discuss. And if they come for Mr. Potato Head, they're going to come for you. It's like, no, they're not. Like, they didn't exactly. even do anything. All they did is take the Mr. and Mrs. Potato Head and put it in one box. You can still be either one. <laughs> uh, it's not like you can't get Mr. Potato. All the stuff is still there. They just decided to put it all in one box. Like, who that's, cares? That's Why does anyone value. care about that? I mean, as, as a parent, I will say that is a good value right there. My child right. can play with Mr. or Mrs. Potato Head either way if they want to. Exactly. Thanks and for it's, saving us money, Hasbro. Rhode Island Company, by the way. <laughs> great, great point. And it's like really we're we're, we're going to sit here and we're going to complain and moan about like interchangeable parts it's not like you can just like for example it's not like you can actually have a real life-size toy or or figure of a male and say hey i'm gonna rip off the genitalia of a guy oh we're not he's castrating a, he, ken like right we're not castrating ken or or we're we're not trying to like ugh, yeah, the I don't thought. think I don't think Ken has got anything going on, anyways. I mean, if I if I recall from being a child, mm -hmm. I made a trade once because I had my WWF wrestling figures. Oh, nice! And my cousin, who was a girl, had Barbies, and I was like, "Well, Ken would make a good wrestling figure. I will trade, you know, something to you for this Ken, and I can have him wrestle Hulk Hogan and be like the next bad guy." Those big <laughs> rubber ones that yeah. were like. This? Yep, exactly. Yeah, you know, those, exactly I had Jimmy Snuka and like Macho. I had a bunch of those. Yeah. So if I if I recall, you know, going back, I don't know, thirty years at this point, I don't think Ken had anything under the trunk. So we don't have to worry about Ken. That's right. Wow. It's it's <laughs> it's crazy just thinking about it. Whereas it's like, <laughs> oh man, it's it's like how how the hell did we end up here? I I need to know. I I, I need to. Did a number on us, and now we're still reeling, basically, right? Like seriously, like I mean, like gentlemen, like let's let's make something. Let's get let's get this the stove fired up because it's been a year, and you mentioned this, Christian, before we even started this, and it was like, really? Oh my God, you you're right. Like next. What's today? Oh, next Thursday. Next Thursday yeah. will be the one year anniversary of where were you when the world decided it was going to go upside down? Yeah, Christian, you were on the air for that, right? Story yeah, time, Jones. Christian. Go ahead. Story yeah. time. Jones and I were on the air, and I think we had a full show because I don't think there was a game that night. If there was, we probably wouldn't have been able to talk about it because when there's games, we're usually on the island for like a half hour, yeah. and then we're on after the game. So I think we had a full show that day. And we were all sort of watching the news and talking about whatever topic we were talking about that day. And then the Rudy Gobert news came out. And that was the first kind of domino, you know? Like yeah, it was. Came out that Rudy Gobert, they were delaying the start of the game because of a test. And we all remembered the week before when Gobert was touching everybody's fucking phones. And stuff oh, like yeah. That. Ooh, I, yeah. I, I have ripped him a new one. On, yeah. 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 That was, that was real cool, Rudy. Nice job. Uh, <laughs> and so, you know, here we are a year later. And uh, so he was doing all that. And then they delayed the start of the game. And then I think, I think they postponed the game. And then within a half hour, they postponed the game. Tom Hanks and his wife got COVID in Australia. Trump, the president at the time, mm -hmm. if you remember, he was the president. Uh, <laughs> he, uh, he halted all air travel to Europe. And then they canceled the game. That's what happened. So they delayed the start of the game. Tom Hanks and his wife. Uh, president halts all travel and then they stop the game and Jones and I looked at each other and said holy shit like this 
this is happening. Like this is, we were, there was rumblings about, you know, they, they were actually going to play a game in uh, San Francisco, the Nets and the Warriors were going to yep. play a game the next day, that Thursday mm-hmm. with no fans and no other team or other sport had done that yet, but they were already sort of planning for it. So it didn't come out of nowhere, but for everything to just sort of stop abruptly like that and to know in the moment, okay, like our lives are all about to change. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, I don't think anybody expected it to be this long and arduous and tedious and everything, but there was definitely a sense in that moment that, okay, the world, the world's about to change. Like, I think we all felt it. For sure. Sean, your thoughts? Well, I mean, I I recall at the time just thinking, you know, this will be what, a couple of weeks, maybe a couple of months. We're going to, we're going to do something collectively Mm -hmm. as a society to, to curb this thing. And I actually wrote about that um, last year. You know, drop a let's drop a a plug for my work. Yeah, but, go uh, ahead. Uh, on the uh, on the Sports Hub website, in the middle of the pandemic, I kind of spent a little bit of time. You know, and I, I got my toddler running around the house. But at night, I kind of dreamed of this scenario: like, okay, what if the NBA had gone on a two week break? You know, the the country had shut down for a couple of weeks. There were zero COVID cases. And then the season just went forward from there. Like what would have happened? And I just dreamed up all these wild scenarios. Like, you know, James Harden shaved his beard, you know, cause he, he needed to get like the mask on or whatever. And then he lost, he lost his superpowers and all, all this different shit. And it was just kind of fun to imagine like, you know, what would the world be like if, um, you know, COVID just went away. And that was in the midst of the pandemic in like April, May, mm-hmm. And yeah. here we are, as we just commented, like a year later, it's just like, damn, you know, that was kind of like a, a lighthearted take, yeah. you know, and, and, uh, and, and now when we're at 500,000 deaths and, and all that other stuff, it's just, you know, it's, it's really kind of hard to be lighthearted in, in any way at this, at this juncture. It, yeah. And I think for, like one of the things that I remember most was, and I, and I reflect on this big time, cause I was on the T um, I was on my way to work a uh, work a special shift at the at the garden that night, and I'm I'm on Facetime, and and I'm talk I'm talking uh, with a woman, and we're just you know just shooting the breeze, whatever. And then all of a sudden, I get a notification from ESPN saying, Rudy Gobert tested positive for COVID. Utah Jazz game postponed. I'm like, oh, wait a minute. Is this the same guy that was touching mics yeah. saying <laughs> like it's like, huh? This is the same guy. And then, oh, by the way, NBA is just going to suspend its season indefinitely. I'm like. Oh, at that I- time, too, you're thinking Rudy Gobert, like, is that dude going to die? Like, you know, yeah, was, mm-hmm. it, there was not a lot of information at that time. And then, you know, we did get some information and it was kind of hard to, I, I mean, it was kind of a little easier to like, yeah. Take it lightly, I guess, for, for lack of a better way of describing yeah. it. Mm-hmm. And we did. And guess what? We're still in this mess. So I don't know. It's, it's, it's crazy. Cause like, cause, cause Christian, like, I remember um, getting to the garden that night and I got there. Now there are people that are working like on the on the garden floor at this point, the, the arena had already been changed over back to um, back to Celtics. So it's already all in Celtics. And we was we were supposed to get ready for uh, for, for what for what I could remember. It was supposed to be a Friday night game, the Celtics that um that at that time. Mm-hmm. And I came out onto the floor, and I said, "Guys, did you not hear the news?" They're like, "No, what are you talking about?" I'm like Rudy Gobert tested positive for COVID, and the NBA has decided to suspend its season indefinitely. One of the things that I'll, I'll never forget was the reaction. And they were, everybody was just like, "Seriously? Oh my God! They're canceling this. They're gonna stop the season for a flu? Yeah. Oh my gosh! Are you serious? This is what we've come to." And I'm like, mm, "Something bigger is happening because if a sports league is gonna cancel or suspend indefinitely suspend its season." I don't know, but I remember the next morning. I put, I, I'll never forget this because all I knew was that I was on my way to WMFO, Sean's uh, radio al- 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 alma mater. Yep. I remember going to the station and I got on the air at 12 and all I kept thinking was, 
something massive is about to happen in terms of the sports world as we knew it. I didn't know what it was, but I got Twitter on the computer feed in front of me. I'm talking on the air and I still have those, those, those radio shows and in wish that at 1230, the NHL announced they was going to suspend the season indefinitely. Then it was, then it was major baseball later in the afternoon, but then also remember college basketball, they had its tournaments already. Yeah, either, sure. yeah. yeah that, that was, that was either about to start or was already in progress. So they had to postpone all of that. So the actual tournament hadn't started. They were doing the conference tournaments. Yeah. And they stopped them. Yeah. It was like right. uh, the Ivy League stopped first and like the the smaller league stopped first. Mm-hmm. And then like, you know, the Big East and all these other ones were like, uh, <laughs> 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 they didn't want to, you know, they didn't want to. Yeah. Yeah. Like, you know, it, the tournament you have to, once one conference is out of it, you can't have the tournament anymore. You know? Exactly. And I just remember just saying to myself, what's next? So wait a minute. We have never seen a world where literally sports was just completely not non-existent. We only yeah. had seen it once in our lifetime. And, and this was 9-11 where for six days there was no baseball. The NBA season hadn't even started yet. The NHL season hadn't even started yet. It was preseason yeah. by that point, but it had, the season hadn't really gotten underway. But we had never seen where the entire sports world as we knew it just – just went complete shutter, like shut the, shut its door. The so NFL missed one week after nine eleven, just one. Yeah, yeah, like like the NFL like just said we we're gonna postpone that week and then come back the following week, yeah. and 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 interestingly enough, that was the week that the Patriots they they hosted the New York Jets. If, yeah. if I mean, I'm sure you both, both you guys remember mm-hmm. in Jersey. Yeah, I remember. That. Yeah. Yeah, John Andrewsy had had his brothers who were um, a part of the the, uh, the FDNY at the time, but I mean a year later, it's like, what's I mean, what's changed exactly? Oh, let's see, presidents changed. Um, let's see what else. Oh, that's right, fans are just now starting to return. Yeah. And I want to get both of your thoughts. March twenty second is when fans will be allowed to return back to the garden. To watch the to watch the Bruins first, the Celtics that 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 for first will be for them on March 29th. Mm-hmm. Are you two ready to return back to games and watch live games in person? Sean, go ahead. I talked about this with Flynn actually uh, when we were filling in for you and Jones uh, on President's Day night, and uh, you know basically I just I. I don't, I mean, I love live sports, but I just don't have that drive to be doing that. I just think there's, there's kind of too much on the line and, and, you know, I know it's, there's an extensive, like uh, probably a testing protocol and there's all the stuff that you got to do before you actually get into the garden, but you do that, you combine it with what the prices are probably going to be. And it's just, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm fine. I'll, uh, (laughs) I'll, I'll, I, uh, you know, as, as we've kind of covered this ground, I got, I got a newborn, I got things to do. Um, you know, I'll, I'll wait until things are a little more normal. And it, cause it, it's just like this whole thing. And I'm sure it has for a lot of people and a lot of people probably a lot more directly uh, due to, due to specific health issues that they or family members have had to deal with. I've largely avoided that sort of stuff, but still it has made me like super skittish about mm. being around anybody or just, you know, like, going to the sports hub and somebody walks by and it's like, Oh, is this guy six feet away from me? <laughs> you, know, like, <laughs> you, you see the shows and like Felger's at home, Maz is in the studio, Murray's in the other studio off to the side. I mean, like our station has done a great job of kind of allowing people to keep their distance and, and, you know, approach this thing in a, in a cautious way. So for me, it's, it's, yeah, it's just, it's not a selling point right now to go back to the garden as much as I would love that. I, I don't want to pay to go because I know it's going to be outrageously expensive. So it's kind of <laughs> cheapskate in me here and I'm not a season ticket holder either. So I have to be like invited by somebody. I'm not spending that kind of money, but would I go probably if I could sit far away enough and you know, everybody wears their mat. If it's only like 2000 people in there, everybody, you know, a group of five can have their own section pretty much. And like, you know, it's not ideal, I guess, but they do have pretty good ventilation in there and, you know, I, I think I'd probably be more likely to want to go to Fenway, sit outside, 
you're outside. That's a bit that's a different story yeah. than sitting inside an arena. But I also think like, I don't know, there's, there's a lot of, I saw people at these games in Madison square garden. Did you see that at the yeah, next I did. game? Like, mm-hmm. There's people and then there's no one around them. Like you'd have to really work to go get COVID at one of those games. <laughs> <laughs> You have to, like walk up to strangers and start licking them. Like high and five. <laughs> like no. You know, like people aren't like hugging and stuff. And I get Sean. I get like I don't have kids, so I don't have that same sort of worry that you do. But like, I don't know. I've I've been pretty I've been pretty serious about avoiding uh, indoor situations. But you know, once in a while, like I'll I'll stop by the bar on the way home after work and yeah, grab a beer. You know, because they they started closing at nine thirty, and so. Once they open back up and we're like staying on until midnight, there's a couple of places around my apartment that are ghost towns. No one goes there. So I just, you know, I pop in, I have a beer, I go home and that's, that's it. And I don't feel like, I don't know. Everyone always says like, trust the science, follow the science. They say you can sit inside and be spaced apart, right? Like they say that you can do that safely. So if people are safe about it and wear their masks and it gets enforced and everyone doesn't act like an asshole, then I think it's, Mm-hmm. it's okay like it's worth doing and now that vaccines are coming like a lot of people are getting them around here the massachusetts vaccine rollout wasn't very good but at it all starting to pick up, it's starting to pick up more now um so i don't know i mean i i just really miss going to games a lot i love going to celtics games i've been going to Celtics games since i was a kid so i'd uh i'd really um i'd really like to get back to doing that although i'll say this I don't want to go back to Celtics games until I can go to Sullivan's tap before the game. Yes. And drinks and get my food and get my yes. pop shot. Out of it too. I, that's, that's what I'm going to amend it on. I'll go back to a game when I can go to Sullivan's the pregame before the game. <laughs> it makes that's me, what I'll do. it makes me, it makes me mad that the forest is no longer in business. Uh, like, like that's the part that really, I, and I'm not trying to be the Debbie Downer, but goodness grief, you mentioned Sullivan's tap, but I'm like, I'm like, listen, I'm sorry, but the forest was that place for me. Like, like, I mean, goodness grief. Yeah. I, I, um, I've been thinking cause I work in downtown Boston. So, um, going out to see a game, you know, at the times that I do is, you know, kind of involves like a, a walk from my office to over mm-hmm. to Fenway. I and mean, it's, a, it, on a nice night, that's like a you know 25, 30 minute walk. That's like, you know, I, oh, yeah. I don't take the tea because God knows what's going to happen if I get on the tea. I just take a nice walk on a nice <laughs> night after work. Uh, you know, or over to the garden is like 20 minutes in the other direction. It's like, I'm going to, I'm going to stop somewhere and I'm going to you know, get looped up a little bit, right? Yeah. Boston that I'm so used to pre-gaming for these events at when mm-hmm. I return to my office, whenever that is, for, you know, for my nine to five is, um, is going to look so different. You know, all these places that we've come to rely on and you know enjoyed so much over the years, you know, that they're they're going out. It's it's just kind of crazy to imagine. It's yeah. it's crazy just thinking about it because like as 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 you mentioned, like we're so used to going to pregame, like before going to sporting events, whether it's the Bruins or the Celtics. But for me, I think the biggest thing that I miss that I miss most is especially and I thought about this the other day, I said, you know. 2019 Santa Cup Finals was the last Santa Cup Final that you were able to have before the pandemic with basically where life was just basically normal. And in more ways than one, it's like what we are fortunate to have here in Boston, we kind of took for granted. And it's like, damn, what would I do just to be able to say, yo, yo, Christian, meet me at, meet me at, um, at Hurricanes, we can grab a bite to eat before I go to a game. We're like, hey, Sean, like, meet me at Greatest Bar, you know, and, and, and let's let, let's grab some food and drinks before we head yeah. to a Celtics game. I yeah, I, I, I miss that. Hey, let's uh, let's lick each other while we're at it. No, I mean, no, no, that's that's, that's forever a hell no. <laughs> I'm just saying, you know, every everything was everything was on the table pre-pandemic. I mean, we can't go around like former WWE superstars, the Bushwhackers, and just lick random strangers anymore. That's that's oh no. Oh God! See, Brad Marshall could only get away with that. But like, and, and then like, if he did, if he did that to some, the, to, to some random uh, person on the street, or m- m- much less a female, they'll probably be like, "Oh my God! I just got like no." But even then, that, that'll warrant a fist to the face. So, not advocating violence. Violence is making that very clear. Um, <laughs> but you know, you know, one of the things that I am looking forward to is, and and I know some people feel very strongly about this, especially about the Red Sox, because 
let, let me ask both of you, what are your expectations for the Red Sox in 2021? Like, I get the, the, the thought and the ability to be able to go to Fenway again just to watch them, see, watch them play live is exciting. But at the same time, it's like, is this team going to be any good? I get that Alex Cora is back. But, I mean, like, what, what are your expectations for this team this upcoming season? Low. Very low. They're not high. On a scale of zero, zero to ten, how low? Like a two. I mean, I don't th- I, I don't consider them to be even like a product worth investing in right now, and neither do the owners of the team. The owners of the team don't want to invest in this team. It's a mm-hmm. team full of fucking utility players. I mean, everybody who's, uh, in the infield plays like every single position. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> you, know, you have a bunch of utility players, you don't really have a roster. And so, I don't know. I mean, I, this start, I mean, this started before this year, obviously, last year with their shortened season the Red Sox were terrible and they didn't even try at the end I think they'll try this year and they have a couple of players who I like but their pitching rotation is and the bullpen I mean I like Ottavino I guess but I don't know I mean I I don't I don't have very high expectations at all I don't think that the team has high expectations for themselves and I don't think the ownership group really gives a shit what this team does uh this year at this (laughs) point that shows I mean I think it shows in the way they've uh they've treated the the roster and the way they've, you know, sort of traded away all these great young players that they had and gotten mm. nothing back for them and acting like that's, you know, part of this stupid process. Like, no, I, I don't, I don't plan on investing much of my time or energy into the Red Sox. <laughs> <laughs> Goodness grief. Talk about, talk about saying, listen, you're just, you're just a piece of roadkill. I'm not even going to bother like entertaining it at, at all. <laughs> Sean, your thoughts. Yeah. Well, I mean, there's been a lot of ink spilled and a lot of air, you know, wasted on uh, Mookie Betts and, and all the, all the things that the Red Sox got wrong. But the thing to me that just kind of sticks in my craw is the fact that in Devers and Bogarts, you've got probably, you know, the best two simultaneous young guys on the Red Sox since they had Jim Rice and Fred Lynn back in the seventies. They're, they're basically the modern day gold dust twins in terms of being just elite offensive talents in the center of that lineup. And they've done absolutely nothing to support them. I get it. If you want to hedge away from what Dave Dombrowski was doing, that was probably needed, but there were probably ways to reinvest in this roster, uh, you know, which you probably could have done on a cost-effective basis that would at least at least make it look like you're trying out there uh, as opposed to trying to be the Rays or something. I mean, this is, this is kind of, there's some elements of this that kind of me think this is like 13 when they brought in some, some veterans, you know, like yeah. good clubhouse guys, guys with, you know, uh, with some versatility, et cetera. Mm-hmm. Um, except for the pitching staff. Then you get to that pitching staff and it's like <laughs> compared <laughs> to 2013, like, that that is, as you said, roadkill. So my interest level pretty low. Like, I mean, to even make that comparison to 2013 is almost a slap in the face in a way, because it's like that 2013 team at least you knew who who your ace was and that he was going to be reliable. Yeah, John Lester for God's sakes. I mean, when he was still like, well, like but t- he was he was coming off a tough 2012. True. Uh, and um, yeah, I think there were a lot of questions about that team, but they brought in like. The, the comparison I guess I make is because they brought in like veterans who had a good reputation and to a degree they've done that. Yeah. They just haven't brought in any talent <laughs> and they didn't really have any talent to begin with. So, mm-hmm. you know, uh, again, other than Devers and Bogarts, which you just hit your wagon to that and, and hope for some of these other young guys to flash and then maybe you've got something, but I don't see it happening. Well, like, what about, what about like uh, J- JD Martinez? I mean, Christian and Sean, like, I mean, considering that I know he had an awful 2020 and wish that, he looked like he didn't give a damn at, at about it by, by the time he got to September. But do you see, do you see him like bouncing back at any point at all during 2021? Or as you, as you pointed out, Sean, you just look at this team and say, this is just a bunch of guys that are just being put together and let's just hope for the best. I mean, you don't know what you're going to get from Kiki Hernandez. I mean, you, I mean, you, uh, Sean, I mean, Christian, you mentioned earlier about Adam Adovino being the, the main piece that was added to, to, to the bullpen and as well, they went out and they got Garrett Richards, but it's like, okay, like, why? Garrett Richards needed the mercy rule the other day. Yeah, yeah. I saw that. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, what the hell is this? This is new base. Neither did I. I had to look it up and I was like, what? In spring training? What yeah. the hell is the mercy rule? Like, 
Oh my gosh. That's what happens. Like, all right, that's another awesome. guy who has been <laughs> 2014. Uh, yeah, Garrett Richie. I mean, I don't know. Here's the thing: is like the Red Sox could actually be a decent team. Like they do have pretty good hitters in their line. JD Martinez, I think, will be fine this year. And Devers and Bogarts are both good. Hit. They have a good meat in the lineup there. Mm-hmm. And even guys like Kike Hernandez and some of these other guys that they sign aren't bad players. Just they're utility players. They're yeah. guys you plug and play. And it's hard to get excited about guys like that because you don't even know where they're going to be. And I think as far as the rotation is concerned. That's the biggest issue. Chris Sale's not going to be ready for God knows how long. And, you Once. know, Eduardo <laughs> Rodriguez is coming off of like a real serious health bout with COVID with his heart and everything. Mm-hmm. And like, I don't know. I mean, that that to me sort of looks like like Mookie Betts leaving and Ben Attendee leaving sucks because I had high hopes for those guys. Obviously, I think we all did. Mm-hmm. But in terms of the Red Sox actual lineup, like they could slug their way to a couple of wins. They're not going to be contenders, though, I don't think. And there's just until that starts, if they get off to a great start, like if they have a really good April and, you know, are, are chugging along, then, yeah, people will start picking it up. But if they just have kind of one of those meandering Red Sox starts where they're around 500 and, you know, eventually get good around like July or August, like people are not going to care in April and May. I just don't think. And, and you, you talk about like the Red Sox, like the, the need to get up to a good start. And I mean, a lot of eyes will be on Alice Cora returning. Um, as manager after being let go prior to the 2020 season um, due to his involvement with the Houston cheating scandal and in the Red Sox I, cheating scandal. <laughs> <laughs> so you're openly admitting that the Red Sox cheated in 2018. Oh yeah, of course. So did the Yankees, but so, I mean, they all, all three teams were cheating in the every team in the playoffs. <laughs> uh, who was the one team? It was the Yankees, Red Sox, Astros, and who was the fourth team? In the, the Astros were the, were, the, were the worst because here's the thing: the Yankees they were, were the most obvious. They, well, here's the thing: the Yankees were they they were warned and they stopped. However, the Astros said, "Ah, screw this! We're gonna push the envelope. See how much can we really get away with?" Like, I mean, come on, yeah. The Yankees they were warned. They were they they, they stopped. I mean, the Red Sox. They were warned. We don't know how far did they really go. We will never know, because thanks to thanks to whatever protection that Commissioner Rob Manfred, what a what a sackless piece of piece of crap he is of a commissioner. Sure. Like, <laughs> I mean, tell us how you really feel about Rob Manfred. I mean, he sat. He had. He has no balls. He absolutely sucks as a leader. Or what we saw in 2020 and how he handled the, the pandemic in the way that the game was supposed to return healthily. He botched that up. So I have no respect for commissioner Rob Manfred at all. I'm just keeping it all the way a hundred. So, <laughs> so with that being said, what, what are your thoughts, Ron? Uh, just on, on me. I'm sorry. I got so hung up on Manfred right there. Like, on, on, <laughs> right unlike, there. On, unlike Cora, his return. Oh, Cora. Like, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I liked Cora while he, while he was here and it, it wasn't just because the wins. I think it was because of you, you get a manager every now and then like a Francona mm-hmm. a decade and a half ago, who's been there uh, recently in the league and kind of knows how things go. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think that was, that was a, a skill of his, you know, particularly in baseball. It's just, you know, you're, you're a manager of personalities much less now than you are of, of pitching matchups or pinch hitting or, or anything like that. The, the analytics guys are deciding all that stuff for you. So Alex Cora is the perfect modern manager. Um, yeah, he, he got, definitely got, got caught there red handed. Oh, yeah. um, but it, it, it was, it's again, it, it's kind of like the, the old, I, I saw a tweet the other day, the, and Krishna will re- remember this and maybe not you Shukri so much, but the, the nineties band, the cranberries, yeah. They, their their oh, first man. CD came out yeah. like, you know, 20 whatever years ago and yeah. it was named everybody else is doing it. So why can't we, I mean, that's, you know, that's kind of, the <laughs> of all, that's all sports scandals right there. That's Tom Brady with the deflated footballs and yeah. Oh, well, Aaron Rodgers has his footballs deflated too. You know, we, mm-hmm. we deflect, there's obviously some other chicanery going on elsewhere in the game. So it's like, yeah, I don't think that Alex Cora is some weird overlord of cheating or anything like that. I just, I just don't know. I'm here for him, but I don't really know what he's going to be able to get out of this team. Speaking of being able to get out of anything out of any team, it's time for, for what, what I, I'm going to call it the green team shredder because Chris Christian, Sean, I have been now 
ripping the Celtics on my radio shows the last week and a half intensely. Mm-hmm. In fact, yesterday, I did an hour and a half of a two-hour radio program dissecting a column that came out on ESPN.com that's talking, just talking about what is wrong with the Celtics. And let's start with somewhere. Let's start here. Depth. Can someone explain to me how is it in God's green earth, pun intended, that you, you have a mass exodus of death over the course of the last two years? Let's go back to 2019. You lose Al Horford. You lose Terry Rozier. You obviously, um, Carrie walks out the door after that whole debacle of, of the 2018-19 season. And yet, all you have to show for is draft picks, shrewd free agent signings and guys that you just don't know what you're going to get out of. So I'll, I'll start with either one of you can start first, Sean, Sean and, um, and, and, and Christian. What on earth has gone wrong with the Celtics in the month of February? Do you think it could be something that could be salvageable? Go ahead, Celtics hat. <laughs> <laughs> for, for those of us who are listening and not seeing the visual end of this, I've got my, my Celtics hat on. Um, Lucky Lou. Downstairs in my basement studio. But as, as far as the exodus of talent, I don't think that was necessarily something that could have been avoided. I, I think that in each of the examples that you bring up, mm-hmm. um, there, were, there were very specific reasons. This is not to absolve Danny Ainge in any way, but I mean, you, you look at Kyrie leaving and it's just like, well, what could you really do about that? You look at Al Horford leaving and the circumstances of that, I was in favor of re-signing Al Horford. I still think that Al Horford would be a helpful, a really helpful player on this team. He's doing okay in, in Oklahoma City. He could bring some of that back here, right? But not at that money. Al Horford left. Uh, for Philly before he knew that the Celtics were re-signing Kemba and he said as much if I'd known they were re-signing Kemba I might have considered it differently Um, or excuse me we're signing Kemba not re-signing him they never had him in the first place Uh, Terry Rozier was used to get Kemba Walker and at the time I think everybody was looking at that as an upgrade Um, so you know basically though you go into this year with not a lot of depth you have an injury to Marcus Smart, which I think is affecting the team a lot more than, than some people, including a person who is across the table from, from our candidate a lot of nights. Uh, <laughs> would want to admit. And, uh, you know, Kemba Walker's been finding his footing, but it, it is Ainge's fault for having not more of a supporting cast in place. I liked, liked you know, as like a one to, one to ten sort of scale, liked maybe like a seven the Thompson and Teague signings because I thought they were good vets who I always kind of respected their game. Mm -hmm. Thompson's coming around. Teague really hasn't been much of anything for this team. And, and I think they should have at the draft um, done something because in in terms of trading for another vet, because I, if we're all thinking this is their time to win, then they can't be running around with a bunch of 22 and 23 year olds who don't really know how to play in this league. I'm not talking about Brown and Tatum you know, just occupying their entire bench. They, they either need to be all in uh, on winning now or, or I guess what the lip service they've been going is, oh, we've got a few years here. But that doesn't make anybody happy around here at all. Well, not at all. Mm-hmm. The performance is certainly coupled uh, with that to just bring in a, a huge shitstorm down. <laughs> <laughs> well, that shouldn't make anyone happy. No one should accept that because – yeah the two players you're talking about, Jalen Brown and Jason Tatum, you're on the clock with those guys. Like you don't want to be the Oklahoma city thunder. You don't want to have two young studs that you drafted and you get close to, you know, with like conference finals appearances and things like that. And then they get to the end of their second contract and decide, you know what? I can't win here. I'm going to go team up with Bradley Beal somewhere. I'm going to go team up with whoever. I mean, you know, like that's, that's the way the NBA is now. And it's fine. I mean, that's, you know, they have the right to do whatever they want to do. But the teams have to be ready for that, and they have to try and accommodate them. And I think the Celtics tried that last year with Kyrie. Yeah. I mean, they, well, not last year, two years ago. Oh, now years they, ago. Bent, they bent over backwards to try and accommodate him and all his bullshit, and he left anyway. And, I mean, that's just kind of that's just kind of the reality of the situation. I think if the Celtics don't make it to an NBA Finals, they don't have to win one necessarily, but if they don't make it out of the East and make it to an NBA Finals – before Jason Tatum's uh, second deal is over, which is in four years. I mean, you heard Wick on 
with uh, Felger and Maz, and he's like, the ink's not even dry on the contracts yet. And it's like, the ink's definitely dry on Jalen Brown's contract. That was last year, okay? So maybe on Tatum, but you know what? Four years goes by really quick. And one of those years right now, this year, seems like it's going to be a wasted year. Like, this team is probably a four-seeded best. I think we all kind of agree on that, barring some kind of major move at the deadline. But you and I and everybody all know that no one's going to trade with Danny Ainge at the deadline. No one wants to do deals with him. He only tries to rip everybody off. And that's why the last, I don't know, five, six years at the deadline, they haven't been able to do a blessed thing. Their last deadline move was Isaiah Thomas. Like That's not a coincidence. Like he's had, he's got a real bad reputation and I'm not sure Danny Ainge needs to be fired, but if you think that right now is another rebuild for these Celtics, which it kind of is, I mean, Sean, you just said it. There's points in the game where there's like five guys on the court who are all under 23 years old. And it's like, okay, like, weren't we supposed to be at the point in this whole rebuild and and process and everything where it's time to start winning championships instead of being a four seed at best and having a bunch of guys on the court who don't know how to play like that, that to me is, uh, is pretty frustrating. And I feel like ownership's got to be frustrated by that too. And Danny Ainge just kind of painted himself into this corner now where it's really hard for him to upgrade. He's missed on a couple of drafts mm-hmm. in a row and no one wants to deal with his bullshit. <laughs> That's pretty much it. So the Celtics are in kind of a tough spot, I think. And you know, what's, you know, what's interesting. I was saying last week that it's time for a major shakeup in Boston when it comes to the Celtics. And I was actually advocating that Danny Ainge should be fired. Maybe, maybe I, I haven't heard it anywhere else. Maybe it's just because I, I just missed out. But I strongly made a case that why Danny Ainge should be let go. And this is my reason. As you perfectly put it, Christian, that's two drafts in a row that Danny Ainge has, has literally swung and missed. Okay, you drafted Peyton Pritchard, who has shown me something this year. I mean, he's shooting, what, 38% from the, from the three-point three, three, four, four line. And as well as Aaron Neesmith, with the jury still out on this on on this kid, so we we don't so we don't know exactly what you have there. But here's the bigger issue: when I was asking about the the mass exodus of those guys like Harford, Rozier, Kyrie, I should have also mentioned Marcus Morris as well. It it just seemed like those guys leave. But what did you do to actually add depth to the team? Because let's face it, Jeff Teague has been an absolute disaster up until this point. Tristan Thompson hasn't given you a whole lot offensively. So at the guard position, let's be honest, they are thin. And you're you're asking me to put a lot of faith in a guy in Kemba Walker who, frankly, his knee issue is not going to go away anytime soon. So if, if I'm a Celtic fan, I'm looking at the scene and I'm like, what the hell happened to, to the depth that we were supposed to have? The guys that that's been added haven't, have not given much at all. So to, to my attention turns to Danny Ainge. Is it fair to say that, listen, I think it may be time for a major shakeup because frankly, you, if you're missing out on drafts and if free agent signings are not working out in a way that they should work out here, like, what are we doing? I, I wouldn't advocate for firing Danny Ainge def- uh, at this point. But, uh, you know, I think this is this is definitely something that's going to come into focus, particularly with the draft history. I mean, you raise a really good point there. Um, is, you know, you mentioned Kemba, and, and it's like, well, yeah, this, this kind of sucks that this is going to be a thing. But I also was looking on, just looking on basketball reference was something I was working on looked at Chris Paul, looked at Kawhi Leonard, looked at a lot of players who, you know, this is the low management era. These Mm -hmm. are guys who routinely miss 20 games every year, and yet they're still future Hall of Famers, and they're still guys that their teams count on come playoff time. So I I don't think that Kemba Walker, I don't think that that's necessarily all that bad of an outcome for him, you know, to, to salvage that. And that's what we're talking about. How do we salvage this season? How do we salvage this team going forward? I think as far as salvaging this season, uh, getting better than what Christian refers to as, you know, a four seat, (laughs) um, which, you know, and yeah, it's, it's a, it's a pretty much a free for all after the one, two teams in the East, everybody's Mm kind of had their ups and downs. I'd say Um, the top three. Yeah. Philly, Brooklyn, and Milwaukee, I think, are locked. And Milwaukee, in. right? But but right. but but Philly and Bo- in Brooklyn, or or locks because and and I was and I was making this point to someone else. I was saying, listen, Joel and Bead, we're finally seeing the whole package. What you're seeing is something absolutely freaking scary. 
that mm. there's no getting around that right now he's my lock to win the nba mvp mm. yeah i mean that's uh, particularly with onto the kumpo winning a couple in a row um not mm. shooting all that well from the foul line still not having a three-point shot there's probably going to be some voter fatigue for him harden now a regular mvp candidate has got himself in a situation where you know none of those guys in brooklyn are going to win mvp so hey give credit to Embiid for for taking things seriously give credit to doc there yeah that's something, you know, where Doc is making a difference. And I think everybody here kind of was like, and that's what it is. We've been resting on our laurels here in Boston, despite not having actually won anything because the Celtics were able to smartly rebound from trading Garnett and Pierce in 2013. And Doc Rivers saying that he wanted out and get Brad Stevens and get back to the playoffs in a couple of years and have this rosy future in front of them and land two franchise t- style players. You need a dynamic duo in this NBA. Mm-hmm. We thought that everything was going to be all good. But they've missed out some of the details and some the, the blame pie. There's plenty of pieces. Some of it is coaching. Uh, some of it is is the executive leadership. And, you know, some of it is just the fact that they don't they need. If no one's going to trade with Ainge, they need to hit the buyout and they need to land a move like a PJ Brown type move from yeah. 2008. I don't know who that is, but it's somebody that's got to be mean, somebody that's got mental and physical toughness and experience winning in the NBA. Is it PJ Tucker? Is that, I don't know exactly, you know, I'm not going to speculate who that guy is, but this team needs to know how to win and they can bring in a guy who's not going to score 20 points a game, but can come out that bench, provide that depth and give them that mental edge that they are clearly lacking. Yeah. I mean, they're lacking it and they're lacking it with their young players too. Like Grant Williams was supposed to be a PJ Tucker type. He was right. Mm -hmm. What they thought he would be. Great the only point. thing he's done this year is have Trey Young bounce the ball off his giant ass, and then <laughs> <laughs> that's Grant Williams' one highlight. Have you seen those like crypto highlight things that you can buy now, like those that NBA hoop thing? Yeah, like, like one player, Christian top shot, top shot. Yep. I want to buy Grant Williams. <laughs> I want to buy stock in Grant Williams' giant ass and Trey Young bounce. The ball off. Uh, <laughs> Where do I invest? I mean, I mean, damn. Uh, <laughs> I mean, let's listen, listen, listen. When, when you when you talk about you, you talk about the, the Celtics, especially when it uh, when it comes to like resting on laurels, laurels. One of the things that I've been a real uh, a, re- a real uh, critic when it comes to the Celtics is that for too long I've always have had this belief that the Boston Celtics they have to stop living in the past and they need to focus on the present. And one of the things that I and I thought about this the other day, and this is this this may fall under the, the hot take or or not, but it was a thought. I said, you know, let's go back to last summer, East Finals against the Miami Heat. Maybe, and I'm and I know it was talked about here at nauseum when it, we're talking about the the situation with Marcus, uh, no, Marcus Smart, and um and as well as uh, Jalen yeah, yeah. Brown, the the, shot, the shouting match. Yeah. yeah. And I said, hmm, is it possible that that situation may have somehow translated and moved its way, it crept its way into this season's team? Although, even though with the new additions and the draft picks and so forth, is it possible that some of the underlying issues that existed in the locker room from last season has moved into this year's team? Yeah, I mean, I think that's definitely possible. Uh, I don't know. I mean, Marcus Smart hasn't played in a long time, and I think that there's issues when you have young superstars who kind of carry themselves like they've won a bunch of championships and they haven't won anything. One thing I take issue with what you just said, though, is that Celtics fans, you're right, Celtics fans in general, I think, kind of live in the past, but yeah. the franchise hasn't been doing that. The franchise has been kind of doing the opposite, if you think about it. It's all about the future. Don't worry. This That's year's true. okay. You just got to wait, wait mm. until these guys develop, wait until Tatum becomes, you know, reaches his final form and Jalen Brown, what does all this and Peyton Pritchard and all these got time Lord, wait for him. It's just wait, 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 wait. So, you know, I, I feel like the Celtics lately, and maybe this will start happening because now, now that they're, you know, in a sort of a fringe playoff team, I would say, or like a middling playoff team, people mm. might start pining for the days when they were making it to the Eastern conference finals. Maybe that's the pass that people will get hung up on. <laughs> <laughs> which is pretty pathetic considering the history of the Celtics. 
Like you won 16 titles and you're hung up on a couple of Eastern conference appearances, like shut up. Uh, but either way, I think that, um, you know, the Celtics have, have a, they're at a crossroads right now. You know I mean? I think this is a crossroads type of season. It's obviously a regression. We'll see how far they make it in the playoffs and, and how all that goes. Maybe it won't be, but assuming that they don't get as far as they did last year, this is, you know, considered a step back. And when a team that was ascending like that and has all these young players takes a step back, you have to take stock of, why that happened and who was responsible for it. And, you know, if someone else needs to take on the next phase of the Celtics, maybe it should be a fresh voice. Maybe it should be a fresh, uh, you know, a fresh uh, set of eyes, something like that. I, I don't think that that's a, a ridiculous thing. And I also think, you know, for the Celtics, it's time to stop either living in the past or looking ahead. It's time to start thinking about these guys right now, because you only have a couple more years guaranteed with them. And I think that's really important. I'm not going to buy the personality conflicts necessarily because I think a team that's winning, you know, that's like the ultimate elixir right there. Any, any time that you have conflict, if you're able to, to get past that and win ball games, then, you know, nobody's going to be griping. And I do feel like a competent um, leader in the front office and, you know, competent leaders in the front office and the coaching staff might have identified if there was a real problem there. Well, Marcus Smart is pretty much their most tradable piece in terms of yeah. like from a salary perspective, you can get bang for your buck back by combining Marcus Smart and all NBA defender with you know a couple other pieces and getting something back. They would have made either that move or they would have traded Jalen Brown for James Harden and they didn't do either. So that to me makes me think that at least they identify that they can get past whatever that was last year and succeed. The only thing is they're not winning right now. There's, there's reasons we've listed them why they're not winning. You know, we'll take stock of that again at the end of the year, because you know, maybe it is time to get impatient about the future, not necessarily being in the now. Why, why do you feel that Danny Ainge has become so gun shy in terms of making that big move? Because we've seen it in recent years in the NBA, especially this season, obviously with, with the Nets going out to making that trade for James Harden out of Houston, but you've you've also have seen other teams like show some sort of like guts and will and willingness to want to make a move. Like we saw with Golden State a few years ago, they went out and signed Kevin Durant um, in the summer of 2016. I'm just using those as as an example. But but why the hesitation with Danny Ainge in regards to going out and making that move that's going to make your team a, ch a legitimate championship contender? Because right now the Celtics they're not that at all. I think it's two reasons, Shukri. I think uh, the first reason is that uh, Danny Ainge, as he should be, is kind of in love with his own draft picks, like especially the guys who were picked in the lottery. Like he loves Tatum. He loves Brown. He loves Marcus Smart. Mm -hmm. um, you know, he wouldn't trade those guys for anything. And the other part of it is kind of combined is that Danny Ainge doesn't just do trades just to do them. He does trades when he knows he's going to win the trade. And in order for him to feel like he'd win a trade involving Jalen Brown, for example, he'd have to get back like Giannis or LeBron or Dame Lillard or something like that. Mm -hmm. And that's just, it's not going to happen because other teams don't value Jalen Brown like that. Uh, and same with Jason Tatum, as much of a superstar as he is for Danny to trade Jason Tatum, he'd want LeBron and Anthony Davis. Like, you know what I mean? Like it's <laughs> yeah. he doesn't think of these things normally. He thinks about them from this weird perspective of I have to win this trade and I have to make everyone know that, I completely pants this other guy. And so that means other uh, GMs aren't going to want to deal with him. And I feel like that's been a big problem here the last five years. And I don't think that he's necessarily even that gun shy. I think he tries to make trades. It's just, they're not in the realm of reality. Like he, he had this thing set up with the Pacers. You could have had Miles Turner and Doug McDermott and maybe even a first round draft pick according yeah. to the Indy star. And he said, no, I need Victor Oladipo too. For Gordon Hayward, like, what do you think Gordon Hayward is? <laughs> I need T.J. Warren thrown into the deal. Like, T.J. Warren is a budding star over there. I know he's hurt this year, but, like, yeah. he dropped, like, 50 points, like, two games in a row in the bubble last year, and he's one of their better players. And it's like, you know, okay, Danny, like, I get that you want to win all these trades, but at some point you have to take what's dropped in your lap and stop focusing on, oh, everybody needs to know that I won. So that, I think, is why he's gun-shy. He's in love with his prospects, and he just doesn't feel like – a trade's worth doing unless he completely blows the other guy out of the water. You also got to kind of wonder when Danny thinks that he's done, right? Because, you know, at least the, the, the public explanation right now is, Oh, you know, we're not done. We're going to, you know, we got, we got time left on these superstar level players contracts. I mean, he did pants Cleveland in the Kyrie trade. I mean, unless you think that, that well, Colin Sexton, <laughs> 
Colin Sexton's still on the Cavs, and Kyrie's not here anymore. So I don't know. <laughs> that, that's true. But I mean, Colin Sexton, nice young player. I know he's putting up numbers. I know he's shown in a few games this year he's really flashed uh, some scoring talent. But you know, scoring point guards are a dime a dozen in today's NBA, mm-hmm. frankly. And I think Kyrie Irving, you're talking about an All NBA talent. He had to take that chance at the time, but. You know, it was kind of like, well, when he brought in Gordon Hayward and Kyrie, the thought was, well, is he done now? Is this the team that's supposed to get banner number 18? And and then obviously we've we've reverted a little bit here. It's it's kind of like Ainge is aware. Um, he's aware of the Celtics. He's I, I feel like he's aware of the market a little too much that maybe people may not want super be jazz to come here. And he's afraid of getting trapped which is why I think he didn't spring for Turner in that 18 million a year contract, because at that point you've got Turner on your roster, you've got smart, you've got Brown, you've got Tatum, you've got a bunch of 15 million and up contracts, 20 million, 30 million contracts, and you're kind of stuck with what you have. And if that wasn't good enough, there wasn't any flexibility. The thing is, he may think he has flexibility right now with the assets that he has, but nobody wants them. Right. So <laughs> it's, it's like, it's like a can of unused goods. Like, Hey, here it is. Like, no, oh, no, I'll, I'll pass. Yeah. That's a, that's a very, that's a very hard pass. Speaking of, can of unused goods. <laughs> so speak, speaking of, um, of, of, of like hard passes. Um, let's talk about Foxborough because Foxborough right now is in a very, very interesting yet fascinating place right now. The Patriots, as we all know, seven to nine last season. And I look at that team and I say, how do I feel about the quarterback position moving forward? Because that's really the major focal point. We, we know that the opt-outs, there's, there's a pretty good chance that a pretty good number of them are going to be returning to the Patriots in 2021. But here's the concern. What is Bill Belichick's plan at quarterback? Is he going to go back to Cam Newton and have him be the starter again for another year? Or do you, do you foresee him making some sort of a trade on draft night or, during, or in free agency to get himself a quarterback? Well, I don't know. I think there's a good chance Cam Newton comes back. I don't know if it's going to be as a starter or if they're going to draft somebody and have them duke it out for the, for the job or what, but I'm not, I'm not of the belief that, excuse me, that Belichick's going to make a serious run at any of the marquee names of quarterback. I don't think he values that sort of thing. I don't think that he thinks he needs it. Um, I think that there's sort of a stubbornness about him that may sort of extend to this whole Cam Newton experience. Well, you just watch, I'll, I'll fix him. I'll get him a, I'll get him a new offensive line or whatever. And like, you know, you mentioned the opt-outs and, and how they're all coming back, unless any of them can play wide receiver or tight end. I don't see, I don't see how that's going to make a difference. Like Cam Newton can come back and maybe get them to eight or nine wins. Maybe or they could go back. They could backslide down to six or six or five wins to be perfectly honest with you. I don't think, Cam Newton is going to come back and surprise anybody next year if he does play. But I think it's a lot more likely that you get Cam Newton next year than like Deshaun Watson or Russell Wilson or Aaron Rodgers, any of these other guys who are disgruntled where they are and might be on the go. Dak Prescott, like you're not getting them. You should know you're not getting them. And to be honest, like if I thought they could free up enough cap space to get Dak Prescott, I'd be okay with Hightower and Chung and all those other opt-outs staying opted out because that goes from 60 to like $78 million. And maybe you could take on a Dak Prescott with that kind of money. But I'm just, I mean, there's no reason to think that Bill would ever do that. There's no reason to think that he would suddenly change his whole philosophy on, on something like this. And I think we saw last year, he was ready to go into the season with Jared Stidham. And then he realized Jared Stidham's not good enough. I'm going to sign Cam Newton in July. And when Cam Newton plays his way into one of the worst seasons I've ever seen, like, Silver, you remember Ma- uh, Hugh Millen, right? Like, oh, yeah. <laughs> like, wow. Hugh Millen, I thought, was the worst quarterback in Patriots history. And Cam Newton was worse than Hugh Millen. I'm like... I didn't think I'd ever see that in my lifetime. Like I really didn't. And you know, that was, that was so bad that the fact that they never went to Jared Stidham and gave him a start at any point last season, even mm-hmm. though Newton was so bad that they had to yank him at the half and yank him after the third quarter. I mean, what a, what a terrible job, you know, just a terrible job replacing Tom Brady. And I'm not convinced that it's really going to get any better. You know, maybe they'll draft somebody in the first round. If they do, I say great. But until I see that, if it's just, you know, Newton back and, 
Ryan Fitzpatrick or <laughs> Mariota or somebody like that. Like, I'm not, I don't care about that. I don't want to see that. I don't want to see Newton either, but I mean, you know, this is, this is what life post Brady's like. This is what every other team in the league has to deal with when they're, when they're uh, looking for a quarterback and you know, it's, it's new ground here for, for Bill Belichick. So let's see, let's see if he learns anything from last year and does anything different. I'm just, I'm not convinced. Yeah. You talk about guys who need to win deals. I mean, Bill Belichick, <laughs> that description to a T and it's just, it's clear as a bell that here is a guy who needs to reinvent himself. Obviously he's got the resume, but if he, if he wants to stay relevant as he goes from his sixties into his seventies as an NFL coach, he's got to, he's got to think outside the box here. I mean, we've seen it uh, a million other places, but when you talk about some of the greatest coaches of all time, a Tom Landry in Dallas, a uh, uh, Chuck Knox with, with the Steelers, all those guys got past their expiration date. Their ideas got old and the, I, and the returns were diminishing until a, you know, a new guy was brought in. And with Dallas, it was Jimmy Johnson. With Pittsburgh, it was Bill Cowher. And you saw the fortunes reverse for that franchise. So you know, the, not, not to say that it's all the players, but once those guys lost access to those elite talents, they became like everybody else. And that's the danger right now in New England is, is us as a fan base becoming just like anybody else because what are we going to do? Our whole identity is based around the last 20 years being the city of champions and whether it's the Celtics or the Bruins, I think there's an argument there. Who's going to win the next championship in Boston, if at all. Uh, but it, I, it's really not looking like the Patriots. So there's not a whole lot to get excited about right here. Unless Belichick, as I said, thinks outside the box, makes that gutsy move for the draft pick, maybe he brings in a veteran to accompany that draft pick, but just sitting back and, and letting the game come to you is not going to work anymore. I look at I look at the Patriots, and one of the things that I, that stood out to me is we were led to believe there is a plan. I'm not so sure if Jimmy G would or the plan for Jimmy G would have worked to perfection had he not been traded during the 2017 season. And even now, and I've heard this from a number of Patriot fans, we should go out and make a deal for Jimmy G. Bring him back here. He, he knows the system here. He's worked with Bill before. But even now, I'm not entirely so sure because I'm a big believer and you have to be available in, in order to win. There's just no getting around it. Like, I mean, listen, and, I, and I, I'm going to bring up Tom Brady in this particular instance because what was one of the things that he was able to do this past season that led the Tampa Buccaneers to the Super Bowl title? Availability. He played in every single game. You can't say that for, for Jimmy Garoppolo through, throughout his, his career. Like, obviously, he wasn't a starter always, but when he did get the chance to start, availability was an issue. And even when he's available, he's a game manager. He's not someone that you could say, hey, let's just take the leash off, go get him. Like, he's just not that guy. So... To the idea of Jimmy G returning to New England via trade, if available this offseason for the 49ers, what do you say to that? Sure. Why not? I mean, he's better than Cam Newton, obviously. He's better than Jared Stidham. I'd, I'd be happier with him than Mariota, Fitzpatrick, Dalton, most of the other guys on that lower tier of quarterbacks. I think Garoppolo is better than them. But it's just, as you said, True Green, you're right. If you're investing in Jimmy Garoppolo, you got to invest in a pretty good backup because – He's not going to be there for 16 games. And, you know, he does have probably the most connection with Belichick. And I think that's important and it's probably important to Bill. So out of all those options, I probably like him the best. I think, you know, I'd be the happiest if that's the guy they end up with. But also you're right. I mean, you can't just you can't just put all your eggs in the Jimmy Garoppolo basket. That basket's going to break. So you need to bring in you need to bring in somebody else. Be a real crappy Easter with all those. Eggs. <laughs> We're a month away from Easter. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, uh, I'll be right back. availability is the best ability, and uh, I like uh, I like Jimmy G and what he what he brings to the table. Certainly, as Arkan said, he's one of those probably the the best option out there, right? You got a familiarity with him. He clearly has a talent, but what else is there to to kind of prop him up? And uh, that's also something that the Patriots yeah. need to work on because it's like, okay, so yeah, you bring in. You bring in a really super talented college quarterback. Well, that happens all the time where you get a, a top five pick at QB. He goes to a team that's got 
terrible talent at receiver and tight end and he throws 20 interceptions or more and Mm -hmm. (laughs) like what do you expect to really happen if you do do that this year so it it, you know whether it's bringing in a veteran whether it's bringing in a young guy somebody with some talent somebody who you think can handle the system there's other moves beyond that and yeah I I like I like their defense if everybody opts back in but uh, there's just I don't know there's 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 so much with the Patriots and I guess that's good talk radio fodder. It's just certainly not what we're used to those days when we were complaining about mm-hmm. Alex Guerrero stuff and God knows what. And you know, t- t- just and Giselle, but but in, um, but in, I'm sorry if I botched her last name up, but you know who I'm talking about, like Bunchen. Giselle yeah, yeah, Buchin. But it's like we've gone from complaining about Alex Guerrero getting access to come on aircraft and like Tom Brady getting his way and time versus time. And now we're entering uh, an off season in which that I look at the Patriots and I say, even on defense, I'm not entirely confident that they can return to what they were in the first half of the 2019 season. Remember that eight and old star and the, oh yeah the, the, the boogie greatest man. defense of all time oh god the boogie man. Go, worst, I, I worst, hate worst, I hated that I hated that nickname with a passion you were saying something um Christian yeah because they were only good they had a terrible schedule I mean exactly. they, they beat one decent team that entire nine game stretch and then when they started playing real teams like the Chiefs and the Texans and real quarterbacks those real quarterbacks shit all over them and then Ryan Fitzpatrick. I mean, do I have to remember 17. how that ended? I mean, please, that was awful. That was awful. Those those guys were mostly frauds. I saw Kyle Van Noy got released, and everyone's like, "Oh yeah, bring him back, Belichick." No, like, yeah, I'm like, no, keep him away. Kyle please. Van Noy. I mean, he was he was in garbage last year, and I I mean, you know, I liked him when he was here, but yeah. it was two years ago, and the way that season, that last season with Van Noy ended, wasn't great. This team in general is a whole lot closer to the Hugh Millen Pats that you referenced earlier. For- <laughs> than they are to any, to anybody that deserves to be called the boogeyman. And that's tough to swallow for a lot of people. But again, it's good talk radio fire. It, it, it is because it's like you look at the, the Patriots and I, I say like, oh, my God, where do we start? Hmm, quarterback, check. We started there. Okay. We talked about also um, – we, we also talk about the defense, the, uh, you know, and like are they going to be able to return back to even being remotely respectable? But here's the, even the bigger question, and this is – I would say even the most important question of the off season, dare I say, what the hell is Bill Belichick going to do in terms of the receivers? Because now this is two years, two years where you've had average to below average talent at the skill position. Mm-hmm. And you have gotten next to nothing out of Nikhil Harry, who can't stay healthy. Jacoby Myers has been your best receiver like who like regardless of whoever's under center come this fall, who the hell is the quarterback gonna throw to? And what what do you think Bill Belichick should or need to do to upgrade to upgrade that position? Well, I think what he should do is sign some, you know, real talent. The problem is you're not gonna get a lot of interest here unless you pay top dollar because no one knows who the quarterback is, and I don't think anybody wants to play with Cam Newton. If you watched them last year, who wants to who wants to be a wide receiver or a tight end on a Cam Newton team? If you're looking mm-hmm. at incentives for like yards and catches and touchdowns and all that, what do they have like eight touchdowns? Like, Something like that. Yeah. To mm-hmm. the, like fullbacks and wide receivers. Like, no, I, I think that's going to be a real problem. That's going to be a real challenge. And Bill doesn't like to spend top dollar really anywhere, but certainly not at wide receiver. He's never come close to doing that at wide receiver. Uh, he's like guys hold out before he paid him. And I think that's, you know, sort of the thing and he's not drafted well at that position either he's you know he's had some success with trades and free agents with uh, you know uh, Moss and Welker and you know some other guys Edelman who was not even drafted as a wide receiver but like mm-hmm. that's that's pretty much it it's been few and far between and let's be honest Tom Brady made a lot of those guys look better than they would have looked on any other roster I mean that's 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 a fact I think we all can agree with that oh, absolutely so, there's uh there's there's a lot of work to do on this offense. There's a lot of work to do. You got to get the quarterback in place first. I think that has to be the first move. But yeah. after that, yeah, you need some people for him to throw to. And at tight end, at the very least, you have like some bodies there who are young enough that maybe playing that first year with Cam Newton doesn't mean they totally suck. 
Maybe they just, you know, were <laughs> rookies and Cam Newton couldn't get them the ball. Mm-hmm. I'll give them another another shake at it. But Nikhil Harry now is sucked with Tom Brady and with Cam Newton. The rest of the wide receivers, I don't really feel any type of way about, I guess. And yeah, I mean, they just need some new blood. And I think it's going to be a lot easier to do that once you get your quarterback uh, in position. And it'd be preferable if it was someone that, you know, free agents would have any kind of interest in coming to play with. I think those two things need to happen first. Yeah, I mean, maybe it's not free agency. Maybe it's uh, maybe you do something with Stefan Gilmore. I, I, again, if you don't want to pay top dollar, which Bill probably doesn't, maybe you make some sort of move there. Mm-hmm. You take my expensive piece for your expensive piece and, and see what happens. Kind of like what the, the Cardinals and Texans did with DeAndre Hopkins and, and David Johnson. Hopefully we don't wind up on the David Johnson end of that deal, right? <laughs> yeah. I mean, even though David Johnson, he's, he's all right. But, um, you know, until then, the, the Pats receiving core, you know, shy of some sort of motivation to come play with these guys that, you know, they're the Romeo Langford and Grant Williams receiving core. <laughs> the little engine that could. Yeah. <laughs> like the little engine that could. And it's, it's just one of those things where it's like, what, what are we going to do? What, what are we supposed to do with C-plus talent? And that's probably being nice. C-plus that's that's the grade I would even give um that that, that that's good that's good uh that's good position and that's high that's high I thought I thought an A would be high but that's that's being that's being completely Plus unrealistic. Is high for them they should, they should they're in the D range as far as I'm concerned I mean fair, fair enough I mean well, Shukri's just going with with everything today you got Disney plus you got Hulu plus Shukri's going C- <laughs> I mean, I kind of have to bring variety. I mean, I mean, is, isn't versatility the name of the game these days? After all, make it a C minus. Oh, fair <laughs> enough, C minus. <laughs> but um, but speaking of a team that's not a C minus, the Bruins that is, um, and I'm gonna... a straight C, Shukri. They're a straight C. They are definitely not a straight C at all. But I will say this: I'm gonna kind of give Christian a little bit of grief here. Just a little bit, like just, just yeah. a little, yes, just, just, a, just a very, very small amount of grief. I promise. For what? The question that was posed: Would you trade McAvoy or Pasta uh, yeah. for for Jack Eichel? Just, just, mm-hmm. I, say, I say very, very small, only because, because I listen. I genuinely respect you and and the work that you've done, but that topic drew me up against the third rail of the red line this morning and i'm like wait you want to put your best defenseman or and your best winger that you've had since hmm i mean since god knows how long as an option or piece to get a guy that i get has not made the playoffs but he's been one of the top players in the nhl and jack eichel why Okay, well, two things. Number one, a lot of people were angry at us for that. Yes, and not- me too. <laughs> yeah, and it's fine. You can be a- people are allowed to be. I'm not telling you how to feel. I'm just right, telling right. you where you ought to direct your anger because that wasn't an organic question that we just came up with one day. Fluto Shinzawa wrote a whole ass article about I it. I saw on that. The and that's what we were discussing. We were discussing Fluto's article, which posed those questions, which, by the way, I said no to both of them. I wouldn't trade uh, Pasternak or McAvoy for Jack Eichel. If I had to do one or the other, it'd probably be Pasternak because I think McAvoy is more valuable and uh, on the blue line there as a young defenseman. And I also think there's something to be said for having a young center as opposed to a young wing. I just think there's inherently more value in having a young centerman, especially on this team where the other centers are all pretty old. So – there's, there's an argument to be made. I don't think it's completely ridiculous. But Fluto Shinzawa wrote this whole article. We talked about it, and everyone's like, <laughs> oh, Jones and Arkin, oh, they want to trade Parker. <laughs> Neither of us said we did, by the way. Neither of us said we wanted to do that. <laughs> we it because if you read Fluto's article, he's, like, bullish on it. He says that it would be – like a slam dunk for the Bruins to, to make a move on Eichel. And these are the only ways they'd be able to do it, but that it makes so much sense. And, you know, you know that Don Sweeney has a little bit of a thing for guys who grew up around here for some reason. I don't know exactly what that's all about, but yeah, it's, that's his fetish, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> fetish. Like, you know, I, I can't, I couldn't believe how angry everybody was getting. Like I thought Bruins fans were a little bit better critical thinkers than this. I thought Bruins fans. Wow. <laughs> 
I didn't think Bruins fans get all emotional like Celtics fans when you bring up the possibility of trading their little binky best player. Like, I mean, I love David Pasternak. I wouldn't trade him for Jack Eichel, but you can't even have the conversation now. You can't even let Fluto Shinzawa talk about this. Fluto's not some hot take guy. Fluto Shinzawa calls it about as down the middle as you possibly can. And even he thinks that this is something the Bruins will consider. So maybe Bruins fans need to reassess exactly what what they're watching and what they're looking at. And also remember, you're Bruins fans. Bruins fans are tough on the team. Bruins fans are critical of the team. It's not like <sighs> the Celtics fans are very, very childish when it comes to their players. Mm-hmm. I didn't think Bruins fans were like that until yesterday. And now <laughs> I see what they are. I can't, I can't believe there's two, two reactions to that. One, Christian used his somebody order a pizza voice <laughs> right there. Two was, uh, two was Bruins fans being critical on their team. They've been soft since 2011, and they got to admit to that because, you know, all, all I've seen over the last decade out of Bergeron, Marchand, Krejci, uh, Zanino Chara now gone, Krug and Rask as your core is diminishing returns and disappointments in the postseason. And that includes when, you know, you, you took a break from that when you got rid of Claude Julien, who some could have said that maybe he was to blame for that. And then you just went and broke everybody's hearts again in, in 2019. And those guys have been Teflon and untouchable, uh, you know, other than, I guess, the, the bees shying away from Krug because he was too expensive and the bees, I don't know what they did with Chara in the off season, but as yeah. far as the remainder of those guys, yeah. You know, oh, every, oh, excuse me. Disclaimer: Everybody craps on Rask. That's open season, but no one will touch Marchand, Marchand, uh, Bergeron, or or David Krejci ever. And it and it bugs me to no end. And, you know, and, it's it's a that's a great point because listen, I'm not going to sit here and say that. Oh, I've been critical of Bergeron because I actually have been a lot more kinder to Bergeron than I have with Rask. Rask, on the other hand, and I keep telling this to Bruin fans, stop blaming Rask for Game 7 of 2019 Stanley Cup Finals. Because if, if, cause, cause the moment, here's the reality. If you don't get your head out of your ass and realize that he was not the reason why that team lost, th- there's two reasons I can name. Number one, you were the walking bruised, not the walking dead, the walking bruised by the time you got to game seven. And then on top of that, your best offensive players didn't even show up. David yep. Pasternak was a shell of himself. Bergeron, he, he was basically Casper in the Bruins uniform, padded up and all. Marchand, he, he couldn't eat. Listen, I don't know what happened in that moment at the, towards the end of that first period, that ill-fated change that sealed the Bruins' fate. That's something that I cannot and will never be able to get over. But let's not give Krejci a pass. Let's not give Charlie Coyle a pass either. Like, come on. But the whole notion of Bruin fans, give, they, they crap on Rask and it's open season. And like, it's open season for him, but everyone else gets, gets a pass in terms of Marshawn Bergeron. I think it's a fair assessment, but at the same time, it's like, Ultimately, let's face it, we have not had a polarizing figure in Boston sports in recent memory uh, more than Tuka Rask. And I think, Tuka, yeah, yeah, I, I, I think it's a very fair assessment. What do you guys think? And what, and what has he done, really? I mean, he, he seems like a nice guy. Uh, people just they, they cherry pick stuff to suit their argument, and, and perhaps there's some validity to some of the claims that they make against Tuka Rask, but I think he, you just Hockey's hockey's a team game, man. It and is. the Bruins, you know, when when Tuka Rask was was coming into his his own as the Bruins goalie, their whole philosophy was build from the net out. Um, you know, the the defense has failed them at times. The the top line has gone absent at, at times and at critical junctions. And it's just it seems to it seems to me like every Bruins fan is like Xanadu running around with that big flag. Yes. <laughs> And, and they can't just come to grips with the fact that, well, hey, these guys are, are legends and all in, the, in this city's lore for bringing a cup in 2011, which you haven't had in 39 years. But guess what? That was 10 years ago now. We're talking about it. It's been a year since COVID. It's been 10 years since the Bruins yeah. uh, held the Stanley Cup. Those guys were a lot younger then. And I think that Don Sweeney has to make some hard decisions that they ever want to get back to where they want to get back to. 
Yeah, I think Sweeney does definitely. He needs to make moves this year more than I think Danny Ainge even needs to because the Bruins, I think, actually have a chance to compete. And uh, they have some obvious holes. It's funny you guys are talking about Tuca because I was just thinking this last night. All the talk around the Bruins lately has been about, well, what are they going to do on that second line with the forwards? And what are they going to do to sort of supplement on the back end with all these injuries? I haven't heard anybody really talking about Tuka Rask all that much. Like, yeah. they haven't really brought up the goaltending at all. Not really, uh, you know, as a thing after the game when we talked to Judd and Bob or when the few times we have Bruins callers, which isn't that often, but when we do, I feel like they're not really talking about Tuka. And when Tuka gives people a reason to call in, they'll call in. I feel like that's been kind of a steady thing for this team this year. And they got off to a great start. I mean, the Bruins did have an awesome, awesome start. And it's sort of tailed off recently, but you can sort of pinpoint exactly where and, and why that happened and, uh, you know, line it right up with some of these injuries. And I think that that's, that's a real issue. Like they have good top end talent, but they need just like every single other freaking year with this team, they need somebody on that second line who can score. They were just about before they went to Tahoe, they were about to drop posture knock down into the Krejci line. And then nine minutes into that Tahoe game, Krejci gets injured and he hasn't been back since. So that kind of gummed up the works. And I think, um, you know, you're seeing a little bit of mixing and matching now with some of those lines, but with the D pairings, you know, Grizzly's been in and out. Miller's been in and out. Like you have some guys that have been playing on the back end of that D line and they just probably shouldn't be in the NHL. So, mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, I think there's, there's moves to be made and I think that they can go out and make them. I think it would behoove um, Sweeney to, to do something, but you know, that's, that's another tough one because you start shopping around for a second, third line winger or a, you know, fifth six d man and sometimes you end up catching a shoe you know <laughs> you don't you don't catch the fish you want you end up with nothing for every charlie coil there's uh you know steve camper or something like that oh, for every guy that you end up <laughs> making uh making a making it work with there's two or three guys i feel like who just you know can't get it together and you know that, that that's an issue that's something that they're gonna have to that they're gonna have to watch out for but i think that sweeney absolutely absolutely has to make a move there, there's no question in my mind that and i, and I agree with you that this is the year that Don Sweeney has to make a move of, of epic proportions. And the, the way I see it is that, <clears throat> is that looking at this Bruins team and I say, you know, 10 years, okay. it's been 10 years since the Bruins won the cup. And as, and, and as you mentioned, uh, Sean, how this, this organization and this team, for some reason, disappointment has been their calling call. I mean, we all remember 2013. We all remember 2019. And one of the things that, I, I've come to the realization about this year's team is that they have had an element of toughness that we haven't seen in recent years where, let's face it, teams took several liberties to, take, to, to make runs at David Pasenak or, or our best players without any sort of like retribution on the ice. So now one of the things that I am concerned about moving forward if this team is going to make a, a run for the Senate Cup because it, it has been 10 years and frankly – one of the points that you made about Don Sweetie needed to make some major moves, uh, or having to have needed to make some tough decisions that needs to be made. Let's face it, 2021, Krejci and Rass are going to be free agents after this mm -hmm. season. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I, I really do wonder is, is it out of the realm of possibility that the Bruins say, both of you guys, it's been great, but we're going to move on. And if that's the case, and particularly when it comes to Tuka Rask, the question becomes, who becomes the number one net miner? Because it sure as hell in my book cannot be Yaroslav Halak. Yeah, it's it's not apparent. And much like a quarterback in football, you know, replacing the goalie, it's it's just it's a it's a specific skill. There's only so many who can take you to a Stanley Cup final. And uh, Tuka Rask is a guy who's, who's done that a couple of times. I mean, as far as Krejci, you know, thanks for the memories, but see ya. I, I, I've been thinking for the last several years. Actually, I've been thinking pretty much since he signed that contract back in 2014 that made yep. him one of the highest paid second line centers in the league. Um, is it really all the guys that they surround him with? Or is it the fact that he can't help those guys raise their game if he's so damn talented? And, and I think it's, it is time to move on from, from David Krejci. And it's time for the Bruins to think about if you're going to try and coax a few more years out of Bergeron, you know, Marshan's in his early thirties. If, if you're going to keep moving forward with those guys, who are the guys 
that you want to surround them with. It's, uh, but they are so close and that's kind of the, the curse of being one of the top four, eight teams in the NHL pretty much the last three, four years mm-hmm. that, uh, it's, it, it probably makes Sweeney hesitate before doing those moves. That's why we see a lot of those little moves, those incremental moves for sure. And, uh, they're, they're really just gonna, they're gonna have to hit on something. And, uh, I, I don't know. I don't know. I'd love to see some aggression, but maybe because the Bruins aren't like my, my number one team out of the, out of the Boston teams. You know? <laughs> like, maybe it's just cause like, I, I would like to see them give me something that I could get hyped about. Yeah. You know? I, and, I, mm-hmm. uh, and, and it's just, it's too, it's too much of it's the same thing and the same excuses every year with the Bruins that I just kind of, I just kind of lose my ability to get to have any faith in this core. Which is which is why I think this in in the, in the final couple of months of this season because I mean it's the Stanley Cup playoffs begin in May, and one of the things that I'm actually most intrigued by is when you look ahead moving forward and, and they're in a stacked division where you got you got the Capitals who by the way who they play later later on tonight as of this recording, um, and and you you talk about. Philadelphia, you talk about the Islanders and in and you got Pittsburgh. That's five teams that um that, that I, that's just stacked up against each other in the East. And I and I say to myself, one of these teams is going to miss the playoffs. If it were to be the Bruins, what would be your number one reason why you think that could be a possibility for the Boston Bruins to miss the playoffs out of those five teams that's currently slotted? top five in the Eastern division. It's, it's a lot to consider. It's, it's just really with the Bruins not having missed the playoffs since 2016 Mm -hmm. with generally the same group. I know some guys have come and gone, but again, your, your core has pretty much been intact. You assume that they're going to be there only to break your heart (laughs) for them to miss the playoffs entirely assumes you know a some of the the quirks in the the scheduling and the divisions but also b um i think something really going wrong with health we're seeing it right now with the depth of their defense Mm -hmm. being called into question and we kind of knew that that was going to be there in a way the bruins with their uh with their assets that they've had their young guys that we've kind of wanted to see something out of them for a few years now. They're kind of like the Celtics a little bit where it's like, Oh, I want to see that guy get some playing time Mm -hmm. to what end is that guy going to help you compete? If he comes up and plays 10, 15 games and doesn't show you anything, what do you do then? Uh, That's kind of the reckoning with their blue line right now. And, uh, and it's, it's a tough pill to swallow. So, I mean, I, I kind of put it on that. Um, But again, I, I, I kind of expect the same old, same old. They're they're going to be a good regular season team, and then we'll get to the playoffs, and then they'll they'll find some sort of excuse, puck luck, you know, <laughs> ran into a hot goalie. I mean, you know, the same old things that you mm-hmm. hear all the time. I know those are staples of NHL conversation, but I just I'm tired of it. Like I, I'm I'm with you. Like I'm, I'm tired of it myself. Where it's like, I mean, how many times are we going to hear about puck luck and we ran into a hot goaltender? Like, oh, we ran into Jordan Bennington in 2019. Like. He was not better than Suka that entire playoff run. I mean, yeah. you could put the numbers side by side. Suka was the better goaltender, you know, but was Corey Crawford heads and sh- head and shoulders above Rask in 2013. Like I don't get on the Bruins for losing to that buzzsaw Blackhawk team, yeah. Blackhawks team in 2013, but it's it's kind of like yeah, I mean you you had a shot there, you know. You, you the years that bug me are like when they couldn't defend their cup in 2012. Uh, that game they, seven uh, against Washington, I remember. Yeah. Again, we ran to Braden Holpe, who at the time was not Braden Holpe. Yeah. Um, you know, 2014, bowing out to Montreal. Oh, uh, but yeah, the ultimate was 2019. And, you know, Shukri, I was I was there after game six doing the post game, and it was great. We were getting calls from people. They were hyped because the bees had just won. It, it was like, oh my gosh, you know, the 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 city was on on the cusp. And then to come out and lay an egg like that, uh, mm-hmm. I, I just I think there was some disappointment there, but I I just would like to see more accountability. And it, it's it's I don't know the the Bruins fandom to me is just kind of gone soft. They you know us Celtics fans we're get we're getting irration all the time on how we're great, <laughs> and, you know, but but Bru- the Bruins fans got to look themselves in the eye too. I mean, 
I, I listen, I, I've always felt that the Celtic fan, they're passionate, but they're not Bruin fans. Bruin fans just they just seem to have a whole nother level in the city where it's like, oh man, the passion's second to none. And it's supposed to be, yeah. I'll I'll give them that. Celtics fans have an opportunity to be Johnny come lately. Just look at the ebbs and flows of that <laughs> franchise from yeah. you know the bird, Mikhail Parrish. To, oh yeah, you know, mm-hmm. and then you wait a bunch of years, and then you get the the, the reincarnated big three with Kevin Garnett, Paul Pierce, Ray Allen. Mm-hmm. Then you, you know you come back, and you're expected to compete again. You've had some some down years. The Bruins at one point had the record for the longest playoff streak of any team in all professional sports. Wow. Uh, at like 30 years, and that ran out, I think 96 or 97. That was part of the reason why Ray Bork uh, wound up wound up leaving town but again mm. since then there haven't been a whole ton of down years for the boston bruins they've, they've had to rebuild maybe in the mid-2000s mm. they had to re, you know, kind of recover from whatever was happening to them in Claude's final days here but the bruins are usually a playoff team they're usually a top five or ten team in the betting odds going into an nhl season there are usually high expectations for this bunch and i would expect that passion to to manifest itself with those high expectations one of the things that I'm lo- most looking forward to is um, they they went out recently and they got they they got they added a, another defenseman who's six six used to play with Nash- Nashville I think his name yes. was T- 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 Tenorti. Mm-hmm. I'm curious to see how he blends in a, 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 on this blue line because we all know that Charlie McAvoy he's the, he's the alpha dude on the blue line and. I mean, although we, we we have the injuries that we have to with, with Kevin Miller and as well as um, uh, Matt Grizzlick, who I'm concerned about for some reason cannot stay healthy this season. Where in the past that was never really the issue. Mm-hmm. So so I'm I'm curious to see like how does he how does he fit into this group in terms of being a difference maker um, for the for the Bruins and I and I and I understand that this season they they really have gotten a lot better in the tough department. But the biggest thing for me is like if you're gonna add a guy like Tenorti on formerly of the National Predators, you hope that you that you're actually adding a valuable piece, a valuable body that's going to uh, help at least be a difference maker along the blue line for the Bruins. I mean, I kind of think it's a case of like have skates will travel at this point. Like so basically, they'll, they'll, they'll take somebody right now. Can can you play? Are you healthy? Can you get physical out there? I don't really, you know, I don't know too much to be frank about, about the player from his you know, previous resume. Yeah. Um, but it, it's, it's a real, it's a real eye opener on the, the Bruins blue line woes. I think in the summertime we said, Oh, well, if, you know, Jakob Zaboral is going to be something or, you know, mm-hmm. if, if Lausanne's going to be able to, to do the things that we think he can do. And, you know, we've, we've seen bits and pieces of what we hoped out of the Bruins blue line, but, uh, right now we've we've reached a state of of disarray, mm-hmm. and it, it's kind of like, hey, if if again, it's it's availability is the best ability. Grizzlick's got those increased minutes; he hasn't been able to handle them. That's a worst case scenario. There's been a lot of worst case scenarios that have played out for that D line so far. Christian, your thoughts? Sorry, my uh, cat got sick, and since my wife is also in a Zoom meeting, I was mine was deemed less important. <laughs> <laughs> so I, uh, listen, it, it, it happens. It, all good. Don't even worry about it. Oh, oh, but, but, but seriously, oh, how's your cat though? Uh, like, yeah, is your cat okay? I don't know what she ate, but she's puking her little guts out. So, oh, but, no. yeah. oh. I think she's okay now. We'll All see. Right. I, may, I may have to leave again, but <laughs> that, 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 that's fine. It won't, won't be much longer. Go ahead. Yeah, so far, so good. Uh, it sounded like you guys were talking about de- deadline targets for the Bruins on defense. Is that what you're getting? At? We, we were talking about the Bruins blue line and uh, and and the concerns about like the health of the blue line. They just they added um, Tenorti, formerly of the of the National Predators, mm-hmm. and I was basically asking like like thoughts on 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 the move and as well as like what what do you see the like the Bruins doing in terms of making some sort of a a move on this upcoming uh, trade deadline given on given that the playoffs are starting in in about two months from now. Yeah, I would say the um, a move to shore up the back end of the defense is probably more important than getting that you know second line second line winger who can score goals because again, I mean, I said this before, but the Bruins have been trying to do that for about fifteen years now. And it's just, mm-hmm. I mean, it's not, <laughs> probably not going to happen. So I'd say, uh, yeah, yeah, if they Tenorti is like a nice little depth move, I guess. I mean, he's probably someone who will get a couple of 
couple of reps here and there while guys get healthy and then you might see him uh, go down to uh, Providence. But I, I don't know. I mean, I think um, it, it, anybody can surprise you and with the deep pairings that, that exist right now on that, on that Bruins defense, I think that there's some real potential there to mix guys who are kind of, you know, puck carriers, guys who are shooters, guys who are just, you know, rock solid uh, in their own end and, and sort of combine those skills. I think you lost two very uh, skilled guys, Tori Krug, obviously on the power play and Chara with his length and everything and experience. Those are two things that have been tough to replace, but I think that all in all, uh, before the injuries in particular, the blue line play on this team was excellent. I mean, it was it was excellent through the first month, month and a half of the season. So, yeah, as, as long as you can keep the important guys healthy, your Carlos and McAvoy's and, you know, Grizzlick, I think, has kind of carved his way into that, too. You saw what they look like without him. Mm -hmm. um, I think there's uh, there's a real opportunity to make that a strength. And it's something that the Bruins need. I mean, they need it if they want to, first of all, beat out Washington in that division, which they've been at the top of for about, you know, the entire time up until this week. And now Washington's in town tonight. So that's, that's a big game. I think um, it's going to be more competitive than that. The Islanders, that's a team they've not beaten this year. And mm -hmm. they're only two points behind them. That's not a team you want to play in the playoffs. The Bruins don't want to play the Islanders in the playoffs. They probably don't want Washington either, even though Braden hope he's not the goalie anymore. And he always, he always punked them every single time they play. <laughs> Washington's still pretty good. I mean, Washington still has Ovechkin and Oshie and all these studs mm -hmm. who can go out there and Back bull seat. race you if they get hot at the right time. So, I mean, yeah, the Bruins, the Bruins are right there. They're right there. They're closer than the Celtics are for sure. Um, they absolutely should make a move on the, on the blue line, who it should be. That's, that's for better hockey minds than mine, but I absolutely think they need to do something there to make sure that this doesn't become a problem later in the season. For sure. Last last question I'll ask, and I'll wrap things up. Now that the world is beginning to reopen, or should I say, slowly opening up the can, <laughs> like it, it, I guess you could say, let out the let out the air out the out the can, or psk. <laughs> what is one thing that you're most looking forward to doing in terms of? In, in terms of you know sports and just being able or even just social social activities because i mean we've been in this thing for a, for a year now and i'm like i'm i'm over it i'm over it i'm sure you are too christian and, and sean as well um first thing i want to do first thing i want to do is go to sullivan staff and then go to a Celtics game yeah. <laughs> yeah. Bigger <laughs> um i'd really like to travel i've seen a lot of massachusetts and like New Hampshire and Rhode Island over the last year. I'd like to maybe see another part of the world. <laughs> it doesn't have to even be another part of the world, just out to down to Florida or Colorado mm -hmm. or something like that. You know, I'd, I'd be fine with, uh, with a nice trip. That's one thing. And it's not like you can't travel. It's just, I haven't because yeah. if I leave the state, I have to tell my boss and then I have to do shows from home for a week. And I just don't feel like doing this. <laughs> oh, that's understandable for sure. Yeah. And also traveling now, like you don't know where you're going and what country, if you go to another country, how they're dealing with COVID and all that shit. And so like, I don't, I don't know. I, I think traveling is one thing I really miss. Concerts is another thing I really miss. Mm. Uh, and going to Sullivan's Tap and getting drunk and playing Papa Shot is something I really miss. <laughs> So those things all concerts uh traveling solving stuff <laughs> oh man yeah. go ahead go ahead sean i really wonder what concerts are going to be like um it's a great question yeah you know when when that comes back i mean maybe this summer hopefully there's some bands or, or groups that are doing it mm -hmm. um you know maybe the, some sort of an outdoor concert slate that might be good but you know i'm, I'm pretty much resigned to you know, having my life be what it is now that I got two kids uh, under the age of three mm -hmm. um, before COVID hit. And again, you know, like cry me a river, but my wife and I were like, let's go to Paris, you know? <laughs> and we thought, all right, it would be great to go to Paris in like May, I think. Well, obviously that didn't happen. Um, and then it's just kind of like the realization, all right, well, now we have a baby, you know, another baby. I don't think that Paris trip is, is, is going to come around for a little while. So, I, you know, I'm pretty set up where I just want to be, uh, you know, there's no grand plans, but rather just appreciating the little things like a Sullivan's tap. But you're getting together with those friends, like we got a group of friends, so we text each other all the time. But, uh, you know, usually in, in midsummer, we'd, we'd meet up and go to like a Brazilian barbecue joint and just oh, stuff ourselves full nice. of food and have caprinhas and, you know, just let, let, let it be. 
you know, um, you know just get uh, functions, birthday parties, things like that. Like the mm-hmm. sort of things that are part of the, the rhythm of, you know, getting through a year in your life. And, you know, if I'm signed up for 18 years of, of <laughs> having two kids at home, I, I want those 18 years to be, uh, to be helped along by, you know, the, the loved ones around me and, and the sort of stuff that you look forward to on the regular. Shukri, uh, what do you want to do? There's a, there's a few things actually. Um, first and foremost, I, I listen, I'm waiting for the U S Canada border open because I want to go to Toronto badly, very mm-hmm. badly. Okay. Another thing I want to do is, and I've been itching to do this since last October. I want to go back to Kowloon's. I'm starving. <laughs> I am you can go starving. to Kowloon's right now. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, not the way that my, my wallet's talking. Um, so, <laughs> like, I am itching. No, wait, wait, wait. Go with Sarge or Joe Murray, and you won't have to pay a cent. <laughs> oh, my God. I'm serious. <laughs> They get treated like uh, they get treated like uh, the president when they go in there. They, wow! They, 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 oh, right, this Your money's no good here. <laughs> wow! Uh, I'm serious. Go with those guys. You you'll get fed. You'll get a nice buzz on, and you won't pay a dime. <laughs> I would. I, I honestly, I I would absolutely. I would actually talk to them about even doing 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 like a like 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 some sort of a podcast uh, recording while we stuff ourselves with with poo poo platter or, or or freaking saga swings because yeah I think I think some of like the chewing sounds might need to be edited out from you three. <laughs> That's a lot of chewing sounds. I I know it's like so uh, so about them so. The yeah, we, we get back to the conversation about licking. I mean, there's going to be a lot that's, of things. Yeah, there's going to be a lot of like, wait, what? <laughs> After we all get vaccinated, let's us three do this from the Kowloon. And yes. Deal. I'd love to do that. Deal. That'd be fun. Standing Deal? Appointment. Tell, uh, tell Wong Father there that we need our own separate booth and that we'll shut up all our shit. And we'll sit here, and we'll we don't have to do it on video. I guess we could. Yeah, if we're all sitting together. We don't need to have three separate screens. I guess. Ex- ex- but, exactly. Uh, yeah. And we'll all eat a bunch of food and slurp a bunch of noodles and have a disgusting podcast. I think that's a great plan. Yeah, that's <laughs> the, no, I'm actually 100 percent all in for the idea. If you two are like seriously, like right. I've been I've been dying to do that. So deal. That's a deal on my end. Say no more. Right. Um, like Sean, Sean Silver, Christian Arcan of 985 The Sports Hub. It's been an absolute blast. I don't even know how long we've been doing this. It's got to be almost two hours we've been doing this. Um, but for for the first time having two guests on at the same time, this has been nothing short of an absolute success. So I want to say thank you both for taking the time out to come on this afternoon. And and thank uh, you. And yeah, my absolute pleasure. And we we will absolutely do this. And hopefully, ho- I mean, hopefully soon enough. We can all convene together and do this from live from Kowloon's. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sounds like a plan. Shukri, uh, thanks for having me back on again, man. Always good to talk with you. Silver, I'll see you around, buddy. And uh, yeah, see you later. A- absolutely. See you absolutely, guys.